So I'm switching from the government, and now I'm going to get into some biology. And, and I want to talk about sort of the story, and I'm going to call it a story because we don't have all the facts yet necessarily, about kelp, um, sea stars, and urchins. Because that's kind of been in the news a lot lately. So first of all, this is our friend, giant kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera. It's found from Alaska to California. It's actually also found on other continents, but just for, for us in the, in the US, or I mean in the North America. It can last, oftentimes it's a year, depending on storms and stuff, but it can last um, a couple of years, three years, maybe more. It tends to be a cooler water species. So when it gets warm, that's not good for it, okay? Um, it's considered a foundation species because it provides biologic, you know, biogenic habitat for other things. It can modify water flow, damp and wave action. It can really modify the environment. It also is a subsidy to other habitats. People don't think about this, but that kelp, which if it gets ripped up, it's gonna to go to one of two places typically. It's gonna go on the beach. Yup. And if it's on the beach, it's stinking. But guess what? It's food for flies. The birds come to feed on the flies. There's coyotes that come in at night. There's raccoons that come in. It's a whole subsidy that gets munched up and eaten and utilized intertidally. The other places, where's the other place you think it goes? If it, one direction is up, what's the other direction? We talked about this the other day. Goes down. Goes down, and it can go down in the case of our coastline here. We don't have much of a continental shelf. It drops off pretty fast. And so those kelp can then go down slope and become either a subsidy for deep sea organisms that might be 100, 200, 300 meters down well below enough light for any kelp to grow natively in that area. So it's only coming in from above. Or what a lot of people are thinking about, it could be if it doesn't get broken down, what happens to that carbon? Does that carbon go back into the system or does it just say locked up in the kelp? Locked. It's locked up in the kelp. And so that's sequestering carbon. So there's this idea that in some cases, it might be better if that carbon heads down the slope to either be eaten slowly or not be eaten at all and becomes part of a carbon sink and takes net carbon out of the system. Eventually it'll, it'll break down and get back in, but it, it'll slow the process down. And then there's along those lines detritus. And this is the key part for our story is when kelp is growing, it doesn't just grow, but it's shedding a lot of material blades, Maybe the entire fronds come off. That detritus, just like leaves from a tree, the blades from the kelp are eaten by a lot of things. There's entire communities who rely on detritus. And if they don't get detritus, they go active and then start feeding directly on the kelp. Okay, so here's one of those feeders on the kelp. So purple urchins. Um, also range up in Alaska to Mexico, can be very long lives, upwards of 50 years, but most probably don't make it past probably 20 or 30. There are cycles of urchin recruitment. They don't have a state, they may reproduce all the time, but they don't have big recruitment, lots of individuals coming into the system every single year. They're much more of a boom and then bust for many years, and then a boom and then bust. That's the normal sort of pattern of uh, urch, purple urchin uh, population dynamics. They're detritivores, so that means they eat detritus. We were just talking about detritus. And they're an herbivore, just means, well, if I can't get some drift kelp delivered to me, I'm also happy to go out and forage on living kelp that's still attached, that's still growing. Okay. And then they grow about a centimeter per year. They can live. This is the scary part that most people don't know. You guys as biologists probably do know. 
they can live for quite a while without feeding directly on something. They can pull dissolved organic matter right from the water. They can shrink and they can have a really reduced metabolism such that they're not putting anything into, obviously into reproduction, nothing into reproduction, but also nothing into the growth, but they'll just persist. So they're really hard to sort of starve out. Okay, that's kind of that, the main point there. Okay, and then we have the third actor in this story, which is the sunflower star. And Pictopodia um, ranges from Alaska to Mexico. We think it could live up to 65 years. There's actually, I was, I was part of a paper that just came out a couple months in August where there were a group of us that um, kind of redid all the information we could gather on what's happened with Pycnopodia and what may be happening in the future with it. So there's a, a paper that came out in um, the Biological Proceedings of the Royal Society. And there's a grad student who was the lead author on that. She um, was up at Oregon State University and probably like, I don't know, 15 other people were on it. This is like an awesome paper. Pardon me? That sounds like an awesome paper. Yeah, it's a pretty cool paper. It kind of covers like the latest and greatest on Pictopodia. Um, it's the biggest of the sea stars. It's also the fastest. So how do you, fast do you think the fastest sea star can crawl on the bottom? Like give me a, a distance per unit time. What do you think? <laughs> maybe a foot a minute. You're thinking a foot a minute, okay? Anyone faster than that? It's a foot a day. You say a foot a day. A foot a day. day. A foot a day. <laughs> a foot a day. <laughs> so it's got slower, like a minute. <laughs> Anyone think fat? You want to start this far in one minute? Three feet. He's going three feet. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I got. That's big. One big minute, yeah, that's like, by the time we were talking, they moved that meter. Yeah. Meter a minute. Oh, yeah. The Usain Bolt of Seastar. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Here's the other one. Okay, this is a this is unfortunately there's not many of them around. You have to kind of go up to uh, Canada and Alaska to see them. But here's the cool party trick or question. If you had a picture like this, you can tell which direction the star is crawling based on just the image. You don't have to actually see it moving. And there's a tell. Huh. You guys look at the picture, what do you think the tell would be? It's got 20 to 26 rays all around. What do you think, think about how they move. And remember, each ray has hundreds of tube feet, these little suction cups mm -hmm. that attach to the substrate. They contract, and that's how it kind of pulls itself around with these suction cups, okay? So, what do you think happens with the rays? Because right now, what do you guys see here with these rays? Like what's, like from kind of here to there, what do you think's kind of going on with that set of rays, that 180 degrees? Are they together or are they kind of spread out? They're all spread out. They're spread out, right? Versus like these guys here, they're all kind of right next to each other. If you think about how millipedes walk, you see their waves, like their legs go in waves. You know? They are, they're, they're kind of like this, this synchronized motion. So that bunching up has got to be a wave. Right here, you're saying this bunched up? Yeah, they're going to get ready to move one leg at a time in the same direction. Okay, now remember, all these little bumps underneath, like in a millipede, there's hundreds of these tube feet down there. So the rays are just kind of like the, the vessel and the, the real activity is happening underneath. So we have, we have a difference. We have all spread out, all in a row, okay? I'm gonna tell you that gives you the direction. So it's either going into the screen or coming out at us. How many of you, by show of hands, you all have to raise your hand, how many of you think the star is coming out towards us. Raise your hand. We've got one, two, three, four. And therefore, the rest of you, raise your hands. One, two, three, four. Okay, so think about this now, right? Think about this. If you had to move around with suction cups, okay? So think about like you had 
um, two toilet plungers and a couple more on your arms. As you move, are you moving by pulling yourself or by pushing yourself? <laughs> It's pulling mostly. Like, think about if you're going up a building with the suction cups. You're not pushing yourself up. You've got to go clamp, clamp, and you pull, and then you go clamp again. And clamp. So you're, you're always pulling it. It's not as opposed to I've got suction cups on the bottom and I'm pushing myself up. I'm pulling myself, okay? So if you're pulling yourself, how many of you now that you're pulling yourself how many of you now, raise show of hands, think that the star is coming towards us? More people, okay. So here's, here's the clincher. If you're crawling around on the floor and you're using these suction cups, let's say you have suction cups on your legs too. Do the suction cups on your legs really help you out when you're moving in this direction across the floor? Not really. And so therefore, what would you be doing with those legs? You just kind of let them kind of drag behind you. It's like the little baby who hasn't really learned to crawl yet. Like when my kids, they just all arms, man, it was all arms. Boom, 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 boom. It's like, man, you're gonna get like scars on your elbows. They just boom, 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 boom with elbows. Once the legs kicked in, then they really took off. Then we had to really pay attention to them. So, but, What's happening here is this guy's actually going out in that direction. And when you see all of these rays splayed out, what's the other thing they're doing besides finding a surface to perch in the song and pull? What's the other thing that these guys are doing with all of those rays out in front of them? They're sampling. Yeah. They're looking. Mm -hmm. Not with eyes, but with their chemosensory abilities on those rays. So everything's spread out in front of me. What's going on? And I'm dragging the feet behind me. If I hit something I don't like, guess what? These guys kind of contract them. Those guys fan out. Boom, they start moving. Okay? So there you go. Have a picture of a pick the podium in your wallet. At the bar. Okay, moving in or out. You got a conversation for five minutes. Maybe someone will buy you a beer. Maybe not. Um, so, so these guys also have kind of, you know, intermittent recruitment. They're an important one called a mesopredator. They're, they're, not, they're not mountain lions. They're not wolves. They're more kind of fox level. Eat little things, can eat a lot of them, but they're not the big predators in the system. And really importantly, they eat a lot of things. They eat snails, a lot of snails, a lot of different kinds of snails. They'll eat urchins. They'll eat abl abl is kind of a snail. They'll eat uh, stuff that's dead. They're very opportunistic. Eat all kinds of stuff. Okay. So now we're going to talk. We're going to switch from the biology part. Yeah, go ahead. Just about the uh, They're not like intertidal, like our. You can't find them intertidally, but um, in our neck of the woods, they're mostly subtidal. The more north you go, the more you'll see them intertidally. And actually, up in um, Canada and in British Columbia, they have them in uh, seagrass beds, which is just something to me is like, well, that's, I would never have thought of that. Okay, so now I'm going to switch on to um, marine heat waves. So a heat wave is when a marine system is when the ocean temperatures are well above normal for several days or more. So what does that actually mean? So they can occur at any time of year. They can occur in any of the oceans. So a tropical system can have marine heat wave, even though the water is really hot to start off with. Um, they're becoming more frequent in, um, in more... Uh, longer lasting and more intense. And then here's a graphic that just kind of shows you. If you look at the line, the blue line here indicates, here's what's kind of normal if you average it over many, many years. This is what we typically see over, you know, January, February, March, April, whatever. The green is we say, okay, let's go to a threshold value. 
And in this case, they are making the threshold value the 90th percentile. So if you're in that top 10%, then you're above the green line, you've exceeded the threshold, you're now in a heat wave situation. If the heat wave is short, it's only a day or two, that's a heat spike. If it lasts more than two days, five days, 10, I mean, sorry, not two days, five days and beyond, then that's a heat wave, okay? This is what um, uh, Alistair Hobday, um, another guy who used to go to WSN, Sean and I um, both uh, knew him, and he's down in Australia, and, and he and a bunch of other people have come up with these, uh, this definition, which is taken from atmospheric stuff, you know, red or weather. So we know about heat waves. They come in all different names and flavors. We had the blob in 2014 when people kind of first learned about the blob, which is this big mass of hot water sitting off of North America. Came back in 2019, but in between we had a lot of warm water periods anyways. That were all just part of this heat wave pattern. And so if you look at some data, so here are data where you're seeing if you're on the line, you're at, quote unquote, the normal, the average. If you're below the line, it's a little bit cooler, and if you're above the line, it's a little bit hotter. So that's the blue and the red. And you can see in 11 and 13, we were kind of in a lot of cooler than normal. And then bam, 2014, big temperature increase, a lot of it. But you can see it's not just it was 14, or yeah, 14 and 19, we had stuff happening in between. It was a very long, sustained, above normal temperatures in the ocean. That had um, all kinds of effects. Something, now here's what's really important. You guys have learned already, there's something where you kind of go, okay, I think this causes that, and there's a mechanism. And then there's other things where this happened at the same time something else happened. I don't know if they're causal or if they're correlated. They just, you know, it's like, if you go back and look at this, and you go, man, I looked at when Warren Buffett sold stocks, <laughs> and man, he sold stocks here and again in here. Do I think Warren Buffett selling stock caused the ocean to rise? Well, some people might even think that, but it's actually very unlikely. Those two things are correlated with one another, okay? So, here we have something that also in 2014 starts, okay? Right when we have this heat wave, this long set of heat wave starting, we have a disease that starts melting sea stars, okay? So, if they literally just start to kind of dissolve. They're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. There's multiple explanations. Initially, it was thought to be a virus. Now, some people are thinking it might be the bacteria that are associated with them increased. Some people say there's a relationship with temperature, increased temperature. Others say there's not, okay? So, the, the, there is no consensus explanation for what's going on, but it is a co-occurrence. Whoops, and let's remember, some real basic stuff. Your population at time one is what your population was at the time count before, plus births, minus deaths, plus immigrants, minus emigrants, okay? The super simple stuff, okay? So what we are now is what we did in terms of reproduction and folks coming in versus how many died or split. So, with urchins, we have some really interesting dynamics going on. Okay. In 2014, Pycnopodia crashes. It's the, most, it's the fastest star, it's the most flexible star, it's also one of the most vulnerable stars. And it basically, I mean, I would see them literally in the process of dissolving. It was, a, and it happened super fast. And I have not seen a sunflower star out here since 2013. They're just gone. Now, this picture of these tons of urchins, and at this site too, so this is my dive buddy, we're doing, we're doing surveys. These actually occurred before 2014. 
There are always areas where you have some pockets of a lot of urchins, but for the most part, urchins are not um, abundant like this. So we still have sea otters. And sea otters, do they like to eat urchins? Well, of course they do. They love eating urchins. But our kelp declines. We have an increase in urchins. We have a decrease in otters. And so it's very easy to say, hey, here's what happened. So this is Josh Smith. This is one of Mark Carr's grad students. And um, he basically was, and this is in um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Basically, there's a story here that they're saying is, look, sunflower stars crash. Purple urchins go through the roof. Kelp crashes. And otters feeding on urchins and their numbers actually increase. This is all to sort of say, well, you lost a sunflower star. The urchins went crazy, ate all the kelp and you have a response by the um, otters, both in terms of behavior, they're eating more, but also that they're actually having some more pups, okay? So, part of their story is, the urchins had a behavioral response, okay? So what does that mean? It means all the urchins were there already. We just didn't see them. They were hidden. Okay? Because if it's a behavioral response, well, if the boogeyman's gone, all the kids come out to play. They were just all hiding. They were under the stairs, they're hidden on the couch, in the bed, and then boom, they're out, and now there's kids all over the place. They were there the whole time. Okay? So here's an example. Yeah, maybe there's you know, hidden urchins. So that's part of the story according to them. Here's some data that show you what I wanted to point out is this story of not many urchins and then boom, a lot of urchins show up and then not many urchins. That's already been demonstrated. There's no doubt about that. Tom Ebert, who was at San Diego State University, basically built a career on that kind of stuff with purple urchins and red urchins and other urchins. So we know that the recruitment's episodic. Come on. Here's from 99 to 2012. Note the scale though. This is 10 urchins seen on a 30 meter long by two meter wide transect. Okay? I helped collect a lot of those data. We used to have a person whose sole job, the only job they had to do diving, was find urchins and measure them. They had a little stick, it looked like a wand, a metal, like it was actually one of those pipe stands that you do using chemistry with a, with a zip tie on it and, and one centimeter marks on it. And they would swim around with their magic wand, <laughs> looking for urchins to stick the wand down and measure them and go, okay, I found a purple urchin, here's how big it was right now. That was their whole job, because it was that hard to find any urchins, okay? It was that hard to find the urchins, and you have many, many people looking for them. I think at some point you go, there are not that many urchins there. <laughs> okay? They're just not there. Because again, that previous slide I showed you, they're there sometimes, and then they drop down, and then they show up again. Okay? So here's what it was beforehand, and then we see this. Now I'm going to take those same data. So these are those little bumps you just saw at 10. They're dwarfed, because now this is what happens in 14 and 15. So we go from about 10 to over 300. So 300 plus urchins, as the story goes, emerged from that 60 square meters of reef. And the boogeyman's gone. I'm going to just play around. I'm going to go forage. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't believe that. I don't believe the data support that. I understand the hypothesis, but I don't think the data support that. So, hidden urchins. It's true that juvenile urchins are cryptic. They're oftentimes in the little cracks and crevices. It's hard to see them, particularly when they're one or two centimeters, okay? 
We looked for them specifically, but we only counted urchins that were already above a one inch diameter size threshold. So it's possible that urchins showed up when? How many centimeters do they grow a year? About one, and it starts to diminish they get bigger. So if you see all these urchins in 2014 that are two, three centimeters, maybe four centimeters in diameter, did they just show up that year? Well, if they are behavioral, they emerge, but when did they actually recruit? Two, three years ago. Because as much as we don't want a little baby to suddenly become a full-grown adult, college paid for, they're off, <laughs> out of my house, living on their own. I have three kids, two of them are back home, all college graduates. Um, but it's like, that doesn't happen instantaneously. You gotta wait a year or two, three to grow up to that size to be counted. So the recruitment had to happen earlier, before the marine heat waves, before the sea stars died. That's just basic biology, okay? And then the last thing is, well, see, you just get the recruitment data. Didn't you have little pads out, puppy pads, little things that you take and you go back and you shake all the little baby urchins out? Some places do. In Southern California, there's some. Most places don't. Then we didn't give you any funding to monitor it. Can we have that data, please? Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. There's no <laughs> money to do that. And we're talking literally about taking scrub pads that you have probably in your kitchen right now and putting out in the inner tile or hanging them on a float and stuff gets trapped in the little larvae and then, and then you bring those back in and then you have actually usually just undergrads with a microscope looking out, sorting through and counting all that stuff. Don't have, didn't have the money for that. Now everyone's just literally kicking themselves going, ah, why did we not do that? Because mm -hmm. for the longest time, there were no urchins to worry about. We had pulses and then there's like, ah, but who cares about urchins? There's, no, there's not many urchins. Okay, I'm getting off my soap. <laughs> um, so here's the other thing. So if someone says, well, you know, these pick the podium, they, ham they, they hammer these urchins. They feed on the urchins. They, they kill them. It's like they can. There's a master's student at Moss Landing who did a study, found that about 4% of the diet of Pictopodia was purple urchins, 4%. But let's, let's just say, a Pictopodia can eat about one urchin a day. They can't do like five urchins. They can only process about one per day, okay? How many Pictopodia did we have normally when we were doing these transects? You might see one on a 60 meter transect. A lot of them had none. So the density is really low. So not a lot of Pycnopodia. And currently they're functionally extinct. And um, the urchins didn't, you know, all the stars kind of disappeared from its almost its entire range, excluding the very northern part of the range, in a year. Mm -hmm. But urchins did not explode everywhere uniformly, which is what you would expect to happen if it really was predation. So I did this. You guys know the story of Hans Brinker? <laughs> so Hans Brinker's the little Dutch boy who, you know, uh, where he lives, there's lots of big dikes and they, they levees that prevent the water from coming in from the ocean. And there was a little leak and he put his finger in it and that prevented the whole thing from bursting. But if he took his finger out. So I refuse to believe that instead of Hans Brinker holding back water, that it was Pictopodia with its little <laughs> two foot sticking in there, holding back a sea of urchins. I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. The data aren't there. I've been diving these waters as a graduate student and then as a paid biologist since 1993. It just doesn't, uh, the data, it doesn't make sense. The other thing too is, <laughs> which is, the guy who did the study on how many urchins uh, a pycnopodia eats uh, generally, he also said, well, where is it that an urchin hides that a pycnopodia can't get to? Mm -hmm. I was like, duh, why didn't I think of that question? <laughs> That's like the simplest question. It's like, well, you know what? 
Those cougars, they don't eat deer because deer go on golf courses and cougars don't go on golf courses. Like, no, of course, they can go wherever they want. They can go kill a deer on a golf course. So pick the podium can pretty much go wherever it wants to kill urchins. So I like to say we had a co-occurrence of things. We had probably in 11 or 12, a big pulse of urchin recruitment that we didn't see because we were, they weren't big enough for us to count by our own rules and methods until 2014. That, here's the other thing too, and I, so, sorry you guys are young, so I, I make this analogy all the time. But <laughs> it's you guys as kids, the parents could just throw down in the basement, throw a couple of pizzas, video game, you guys are good, right? No problem. What happens as you get bigger and the little basement starts getting crowded and mom and dad aren't throwing pizzas down anymore? You have to start actively foraging. So now you've got these kind of awkward teenagers crawling out of the basement, raiding the fridge, <laughs> I'm going to 7-Eleven. That's what urchins were doing. It's like, we're not getting to try this anymore. We're not getting the food delivered to us because the kelp doesn't do well in what kind of water? Warm water. So you don't have a lot of kelp production, therefore you don't have a lot of detritus production, therefore you don't have a lot of food delivery. Whatever urchins are around have to now start actively foraging for that kelp because mom and dad aren't throwing pizzas at them anymore. Okay? And you've also got this loss of a predator, which I don't think is as important as people make it out to be. Okay? <laughs> All right. Any questions about that? Because we're about to switch gears and talk about what I'm doing today and did yesterday and we'll do Sunday.